it may be a good time to remind you of what kind of brinksmanship you're trying to put yourself into. Anybody with the most remote modicum of reason would understand that this is a completely unconscionable context. Even if you believe that you're engaging in some sort of rite of passage that has very high standards, which is one potential possibility that I'm sure somebody would try to rationalize a justification for the maintenance of the status quo, then it has to be evaluated in its full context. 16 days from today will be the third anniversary of the publication of an article that discussed how organizations that were attempting to work with people that had amassed at the U.S.-Mexico border and were attempting to find asylum in the United States and or connect with family members they already had within the United States. These people were engaging in a specific kind of database operationalization, that they were making databases with information about people and trying to find out how to use those databases to find family members, including people that uh, fall in through the cracks, as they say. This is comparable to something that was highlighted in one of the responses to a piece of litigation that was engaged, a case that made it to the Supreme Court. If I'm not mistaken, it was called Hawaii versus Trump. And in the course of this case being attempted to be presented to the Supreme Court to challenge the initial prohibition on travel for certain people from certain countries identified initially as being Muslim in origin. And one of the things that was done by the attorney allegedly on behalf of the people that were impacted was it made an analysis of certain individuals. It focused on four specifically identified what their context was, and then discussed familial relations that would be impacted. I contended this was very dangerous. It was very dangerous, especially in consideration of the fact that to this time, we haven't discussed other databases that had already been correlated, not just DAPA and DACA, by the way, but also the more than 20 to 30 alleged databases through the Department of Justice that are implemented for alleged law enforcement purposes, including in manners that have already ascribed identification to people based upon their alleged demographics and the propensity they might have based upon a demographic analysis to be identifiable as likely to commit a crime. Now I contend and have contended for a considerable amount of time that there are a number of things that made it to the Supreme Court, including in connection with dissenting opinions that were issued as a result of these cases, that would have provided an actual justifiable claim and argument to have certain precedents that were allowed to be maintained, overruled, or overturned in order to address factors connected to new information associated with what had already been identified as a potential area of exploitation were it not to be guarded against. For instance, the dissenting opinion in Maryland versus King highlights very specifically a understanding of the potential abuse of what was the precedent that was being articulated in the majority opinion, and it has come to bear. Now, somebody saying one thing in one context and saying something that might be contrary in another context is definitely worth consideration. But if there is a portending, especially on the official record, as that was, as is comparable to other portendings on the official record, including in floor speeches and the floor of Congress and the Senate, then these are not things to just be lightly swept away. When you refuse, for instance, to take a roll call vote and voice your dissent, even if it's a silent dissent, that says something very monumental. That also accrues. So just bear in mind, before I recite what I have before me, 16 days from now will be the three-year anniversary of that article. 
15 days from now will be the third year anniversary of my original effort to submit before the Texas Supreme Court a writ of quo warranto. A writ of quo warranto that I contend was willfully and intentionally mischaracterized so I would have to resubmit it after the publication of that article and a whole bunch of other events that transpired over that weekend, making it look as if the error was on me. As opposed to whatever it was, the clerk of the court did originally in consideration of what ended up being the surety on it case that I was expected to pursue as a pauper. Which brings up the question, have you literally contrived to try to compel me to plead my case as a poor woman as long as I seek due process? Are you really not going to give me any potential to participate legally and meaningfully in society until I agree to completely abdicate and completely set aside my rights to due process, I have to drop my case. I have to stop trying to go to court. I have to just accept, for whatever reason, somebody else has contrived politically to say, Charity Colleen Krauss, born in the United States in 1977, is not eligible for any sort of due process. She is not eligible to go to court. She is not eligible to get an attorney. She is not eligible to be a witness in a case. She's not eligible to file a report and have it acknowledged. She's not eligible to participate in a congressional hearing. She's not eligible to run for office. And she's actually not even eligible to vote because we're going to make sure that right before the elections come that she's out of town and it's too late for her to sign up to be a voter and also have an address at which she can register to vote during the election. Somebody actually decided that? Are you on the record? Are you going to provide me with the confirmation that those are the terms of the contract you set up on my life? Statement of case. Krauss submits this writ of certiorari for reconsideration of a writ of co-wolanto. 18-0600 accepted on July 2nd, 2018 by the Supreme Court of Texas, to which it has yet to respond. By refusing to respond to the writ of quo warranto within the legally required time frame for which to do so, the Supreme Court of Texas demonstrates that it lacks the authority to respond to the issues that a writ of quo warranto requested they address concerning waiver of sovereign immunity. Krauss requests the court reconsider the original petition in light of events that have transpired since its submission on June 29, 2018, amend the writ of quo warranto to include a waiver of sovereign immunity for the hearing named respondents and charge the respondents with sedition as defined via Section 3 of the Alien Registration Act of 1940 and Section 3 of the Sedition Act of 1918. Now, since then, there have been numerous cases that have been argued and opined on. They talk about more than a waiver. As a matter of fact, there is a justification for a denial of immunity under other auspices and with specific implications. See, waiving your immunity off onto somebody else you intend to have cover up for you or as a means of retaliating against opposition, including people that can provide testimonial evidence in order to justify your prosecution is not appropriate. If you did not engage your ministerial duties with the intent to perform the duties, but rather are abusing your office, there are other remedies besides a waiver of sovereign immunity. But the important thing is this, page, two, page uh, eight of the original writ, uh, request, petition for a writ of certiorari. The pattern of racketeering activity is described in a writ of habeas corpus. WR-87139-01, accepted on July 21st, 2017. H. Con Res 71 was introduced into the House of Representatives, unbeknownst to Krauss at the same time, on the same day. The connection to the Houston flood plan was specifically challenged in the original petition for leave to file an information in the nature of Quo Veronto. 17-0622 accepted on August 3rd, 2017, a December 18th, 2017 announcement of a $1 billion, $7 million Houston pension obligation bond issuance confirms the pattern addressed in the writ of habeas corpus. 
The writ of habeas corpus was cited in the petition for leave to file an information in the nature of Quo Warranto. A writ of Quo Warranto was filed on June 29, 2018, following announcements that the U.S. Housing and Urban Development Agency was set to issue $5 billion in federal disaster assistance to Houston and hence further ensnare the residents of Houston in a situation of unlawful debt. Well, apparently this needs to be modified because it wasn't just to ensnare people in a process of unlawful debt. It was to dispossess people even further of their personal private property, their rights to self-protection, and their constitutional rights by making us nothing more than a form of holding company for a pass-through to be offloaded to other people after sitting on it for several years and refusing to prosecute the crimes and denying many people their rights to due process. And that's exactly what has been revealed today. That's exactly what's transpired in the last two weeks. The role of this bond manipulation can be demonstrated in how the pattern of racketeering activity that facilitated the December 18, 2017 announcement for Houston pension obligation bonds was secured in part through manipulation of the legal filing process in the state of Texas. That includes a November 3, 2017 order denying a request for rehearing on the leave to file for an information in the nature of a quo warranto. It is further demonstrated in how refusal to address the 2017 bond issuance enabled a further perpetuation of the pattern of racketeering activity into other bond issues involving the same brokerage. Now, it is going to be very important to distinguish how what just happened in the state of Texas and specifically in the city of Dallas regarding allegations that a Dallas police officer was arrested for child sex abuse is distinct from allegations that a Houston firefighter was also arrested for solicitation of a minor in November through December of 2017. He happened to have the same surname as the brokerage on that pension obligation bond and a number of other pension obligation bonds and municipal bonds, just as coming up on 16 months after Dallas hosted a huge convention sponsored by Keller Williams. They're arresting a police officer for alleged child sex exploitation who has the same name as the realty company. There's absolutely nothing justified about that. You're not securing against child sexual abuse, including child sexual abuse committed by people under the public trust, are you? Because if you were, then what you did in Houston and what the former police chief from Austin who went to Houston, who, by the way, is now in Miami, did when he stole information that was part of a federal effort to file for criminal charges and used it as part of a database, presumably about identifying pedophiles. More than three years before now, as a matter of fact, going on three years before now, the announcement that the city of Houston Police Department, under the alleged authority of the chief of police at the time, was engaged in operationalization of a database to identify and forestall acts of pedophilia was in the autumn of 2018. That's going on three years. In three years, that law enforcement effort in Houston was not coordinated with a state effort to prevent against the Dallas Police Department, again, coding massive bonds for the state of Texas to allegations of abuse of authority involving accusations of pedophilia, of child sex abuse. Just like last summer, just like last summer, when the Texas Supreme Court was allowing for the cases associated with the state to be used as collateral for what? And in the course of doing that, allowed for a series of cases to be re-engaged through the court system regarding allegations of what? Child sex abuse, including child sex abuse committed by members of the cloth. 
just in time to begin underwriting the election campaigns of several candidates that prior to that had not formally declared. Just in time for the Republican Party of Texas to begin a process of attempting to engage in a manipulation of the judicial process to frame members of the Libertarian Party as part of a strategy that was completely aberrant. You know, see, in all of the allegations of election interference, nobody talked about the specific and strategic manipulation of the judicial process of filing false claims against political opposition in order to be able to incur and utilize leverage. For how long? How long is that motion submitted to the Supreme Court by Texas Republicans, including official party members and including people actually elected to both the federal and the state legislature that identified 43 members of a third party under completely false pretenses, making an accusation that is not uncommon, saying you're accusing someone of violation of a particular law that you already know they didn't violate because there was another law that was actually under consideration. But the court accepted it and allowed it to be considered just long enough for them to hook up how many deals, how many bonds in the state of Texas alone were issued in the time frame during which they submitted that motion and it was voted down by the court. And not only that, how many bonds were issued as a carryover from the time when that piece of litigation was ongoing and then the alleged attorney general of Texas filed against Harris County specifically regarding certification of the election. All of this is absolutely detestable and unacceptable. It cannot prevail. There was absolutely no justification for doing that today. After what happened this weekend, you're not just sabotaging the American electoral process. You're attempting to engage in political engineering of other countries in horrendous and heinous manners. You are not allowed to do this. This is completely unacceptable and unconscionable. 